Okay, I'm going to let just the attendees kind of join and then I'll begin shortly. Okay, I think I will um, begin proceedings. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, lovely to be here on the uh, third day of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. Uh, and this is the panel on history, memory and trauma. My name is Mira Sabaratnam and I'm in the politics department here at SOAS. I'm delighted to have a great range of speakers uh, here today to speak to this uh, subject. Um, I would first like to introduce Professor Gilbert Ashkar, who is, of course, Professor of Development Studies and International Relations here at SOAS in the Department of Development Studies. Uh, many of you, I hope, will be familiar with his work. Um, he was the first chair of the SOAS Center for Palestine Studies since its foundation in 2012 until 2018. Um, and his many books include uh, The Clash of Barbarian, Barbarisms, The Making of the New World Disorder, Perilous Power, The Middle East and U.S. Foreign Policy, uh, co-authored by Noam Chomsky, um, The Arabs and the Holocaust, The Arab-Israeli War of Narratives, some of which I think we'll hear about more today. Uh, welcome, Gilbert. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Mira. Uh, we also Thank have um, uh, Dr. Vikan Chaterian, who is a lecturer in history and international relations at the University of Geneva and at Webster University in Geneva. Uh, he has worked as a war reporter and a peace building practitioner, writing on armed conflicts in the post-Soviet space, as well as the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and uh, amongst his uh, works include um, War and Peace in the Caucasus, Russia's Troubled Frontier, and Open Wounds, Armenians, Turks, and a Century of Genocide. Again, very relevant to our, to our themes today. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. Yair Wallach, who is a senior lecturer in Israeli studies at SOAS University of London, but he's also the head of the SOAS Centre for Jewish Studies. And he's currently, and we're all very proud and envious at the same time, a Leverhulme Research Fellow. Uh, he is a cultural and social historian of modern Palestine, Israel, and his book, A City in Fragments, Urban Text in Modern Jerusalem, looks at Arabic and Hebrew street texts in modern Jerusalem. So we are really excited to have our speakers here. Um, and what we're going to do, we'll invite each of them to make uh, opening remarks for 10 minutes. I'll pull some of the themes together and you, the audience are available, uh, able to um, ask questions in the uh, Q&A and the chat. Um, so we are recording the session just uh, so that everyone's aware. Um, hopefully we'll get to see some of you face to face and I'll invite you to speak face to face as well. But you can, of course, put your questions in the um, Q&A box uh, during the session as well. OK, so without further ado, I'm delighted to invite uh, Gilbert to speak. Um, please, Gilbert, take it away. Sure, thank you very much, Mira. Um, yes, I mean, of, of course, we, we are having those uh, brief introductory remarks on huge topics and very complex topics, that is even more of a challenge because, you know, the, the, the more complex it is, the more you, you need to, to, to be nuanced and we have to speak for, for 10 minutes. That's, that's really difficult. Anyway, we'll, we'll try the best we can, the three of us, I'm sure. And uh, I'm also looking forward to, to your own input, Mira, in this discussion. Um, now, uh, the, the, the theme I'm going to address is indeed related to uh, the, the, that book of mine that uh, Mira uh, mentioned, uh, <coughs> the, the, the Arabs and the Holocaust, and the subtitle is The Arab-Israeli War of Narratives, and it's very much uh, related to the, the topic of this panel, which is history and trauma, and that's what we are discussing, and uh, indeed this is uh, uh, um, probably uh, uh, one of the, 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 
the, the uh, let's say the, the most burning uh, uh, themes of, of this kind of discussion of, of the relation between trauma and history and the present and ongoing history actually not only past history but uh, it is still very much here with the present uh, ca carrying on as history in the making so the the i mean the, the holocaust and the nakba the, this is what i'm going to to address very briefly uh, uh, of course, the, the, the Holocaust uh, uh, in itself uh, it stands on its own as a huge uh, historical tragedy and uh, does not request a discussion of the Nakba when you are discussing it. You can discuss the Holocaust as a European event, a major event in world history and European uh, history. But the, 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 the history has been, uh, has work in such a way that uh, uh, the Nakba, which is the, the, the name that, uh, the, the Arabic name given to the uh, Palestinian trauma, uh, uh, was directly related to the, the, the Holocaust. And um, we have this uh, peculiarity that we'll find that probably in other languages, Viken will tell us about uh, maybe Armenian, but the, 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 the tragedy of each people is called the catastrophe. Uh, which in Arabic Nakba is, and in Hebrew Shoah is. Uh, so they, the, 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 the terms used, each population or each uh, ethnicity refers to its own trauma as the, the uh, catastrophe. Um, uh, so um, the, what is the relation between the two? I mean, some people even dispute it even from, from the, uh, let's say, pro-Palestinian side by saying, well, Zionism preceded the Holocaust, uh, and therefore the, there is no uh, direct relation between the two. Well, that's very, very, uh, uh, I think uh, it's a weak argument. And although, of course, the, the, the Zionist, the implementation of the Zionist project of creating a state uh, of the Jews in Palestine started with the, I mean, started earnestly with the Balf Balfour Declaration with, under British colonial uh, auspices in, uh, after the First World War, the fact remains that without uh, the, 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 the Nazis' uh, seizure of power and uh, what it represented, and then the, 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 the Holocaust, the, the genocide of the Jews, without these, you wouldn't have had the, 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 that uh, the flow of refugees and later on uh, uh, Holocaust survivors into uh, into first Palestine and then the, the state of Israel. So there is a, a very direct uh, uh, connections uh, in that regard. But the fact remains that uh, the, the the state of Israel itself was created uh, uh, through uh, war conditions. Uh, that ended up with uh, that state uh, uh, controlling 78% of, uh, of the land of, uh, of Palestine between the river and, uh, and the sea, I mean, British mandate Palestine. Uh, uh, and on, from that territory, 80% of the uh, Arab native population, the Palestinians, had uh, uh, fled whatever the conditions. You know, you have a lot of discussions about uh, whether expelled or f fleeing or whatever. These discussions are irrelevant to the fact that they were never allowed to come back. And their uh, homes, their lands, all that were seized. And that is an act that even uh, 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 someone who became a uh, rapidly uh, right-wing Zionist historian like Benny Morris, a knowledge as ethnic cleansing. And so you have this, this, uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, relation between the, the two traumas, the two tragedies, and hence the, this war of narratives with each side using it, their own tragedy as a legitimation of, of uh, 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 their views. Uh, of course, for the, there is a qualitative difference here, and I will end with this qualitative difference. It is that the Nazi genocide of the Jews is a, a past event. It is, it is a trauma in, in, in collective memory. It's a huge uh, uh, tragedy, no, 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 no discussion about that. Uh, but it is 
on the one hand, uh, an event circumscribed in history, and secondly, um, the the the, uh, uh, the 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 perpetrators uh, were were not those. I mean, were not the Palestinians. Were not Arabs. They were Europeans. They were. Uh, that, that's where uh, it, it happened. Uh, on the other hand, the Nakba is uh, is not only a past. Uh, event. It's, uh, uh, it is continuing. It, it has been in, a, in some way revived with the 1967 war and the occupation by the state of Israel of the rem remaining parts of, uh, of, uh, of Palestine. And this permanent oppression represented by the ongoing occupation, uh, um, uh, in addition to, to other forms of discrimination within the state of Israel itself against its Palestinian citizens. So uh, there is this difference here, uh, which uh, uh, is very important to take into account when we discuss these uh, uh, tragedies. One of them is of a much larger magnitude than the other, that is the, the, the Holocaust, but at the same time, the, the, the other one is ongoing and therefore it is a matter of uh, real urgency uh, for any prospect of, uh, of peace uh, in the region uh, to 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 get to uh, justice in this uh, in this regard and justice for the Palestinians is crucial in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilbert. That was uh, extremely succinct, and I will definitely be coming back to you for more expansion on these on these themes. Um, <coughs> I'd like now to turn to Yaya um, to um, address us as well, and then we'll um, go to Vikan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mira, and thank you, Gilbert, for these comments. And I have things to say, but I'll keep them for the discussion later. But I think one, one thing is that what is useful about me coming after Gilbert, Gilbert talked about the constitutive traumas of Israelis and Palestinians, uh, the, the things that are the historical traumas that are very much um, con continue to shape the present. Uh, and okay, and what I will talk is about a trauma, and in some ways a shared trauma, if we want to force it, uh, but we, or overemphasize it, but we can say there's a shared trauma that is, trauma that is not remembered. And, and by this, I mean the First World War in, in Palestine. So I'll talk about a bit about the magnitude about, of, of that uh, trauma and why it is not remembered, and um, uh, and yes. So, so first is to say that the First World War is usually not discussed much. I mean, uh, you know, and in, in, of course in the UK, uh, the First World War features heavily in public discourse, not so much in Israel-Palestine. Uh, and, and uh, because of that, there's no, there's little uh, attention to how traumatic it was to the people at the time. So the war uh, involved a set of catastrophes for the population in Palestine, uh, starting with conscription when the Ottoman Empire enters the war, uh, forced conscription and people were sent to the front, whether it's in Suez, the failed Suez can, uh, attempt, or in the Caucasus or Gallipoli. So quite a lot of people died. In the case of Jews and Christians, for the first time in a comprehensive manner, they are conscripted to the military. They cannot get away, but they're not trusted to actually do the fighting. So they're sent to do hard labor and quite uh, difficult and, and impossible uh, conditions. And a lot of the, and again, we don't have exact death figures, but, the, but a lot of people die because they don't get proper food, because of uh, disease and because of really poor conditions. So there we're talking about um, uh, really thousands or tens of thousands of people. And conscription, of course, is a very traumatic uh, uh, experience. Um, Secondly, there's devastation that comes with the war and the, the economy that is built on trade and tourism very much collapses. There's a lot of fines and taxation from the Ottoman and very hard line uh, kind of trying to squeeze money out of the population, which I can tell you various stories. Someone who's looked at this uh, period. Uh, there's if inflation. Uh, and then we're talking about uh, widespread disease, uh, cholera and various other diseases that really 
uh, decimates the local population in a, in dramatic, in a dramatic uh, manner. There's massive deforestation in order to feed the trains, uh, of, uh, and, and that really changes the landscape in a very uh, uh, abrupt way. And there's um, political repression. You know, for the first time, and I think uh, uh, Palestine did not really experience that so much before the war. Other parts of the Ottoman Empire did, but in the case of Palestine, quite heavy-handed intervention directed at poli local political elites that seem to be not loyal enough to the Ottoman project as a, as a part of intimidation practices. So the Ottoman kind of authorities in Palestine take the gloves off during the war, and it's it's in and to a population that was not used to it. I'll read one account briefly, and this is from an execution of five, uh, five people in Jerusalem in 1916. They're accused of deserting the military, and there was a mass problem of, of people ex escaping military service. So there's these five uh, uh, young people executed in 1916. So, and this is from the Hebrew newspaper in 1916 in Jerusalem. On Thursday, 4 a.m. at dawn, uh, five youths were hanged to death in our city. Two Jews, two Christians, and a Muslim were accused of army desertion. Near Jaffa Gate, a line of wooden beams was constructed, each with a metal ring and a rope. Before the execution, two rabbis, two priests, and one sheikh came for confessions from those condemned to death. After the confession, they asked the accused if they had any, any last wishes or anything to say. One Jew asked for some water to drink. The other asked to make sure that people who owe him money would pay back to his mother. The latter showed no fear. With courage, he walked up to the gallows and sang in a sang voice, a melancholic song in Spanish Jewish. He demanded not to be blindfolded, but his request was denied. Uh, <clears throat> then the ex ex description of the execution, which I'll spare you, and then the bodies were left hanging until uh, nine for the public to see in fear. A large crowd from the city's resident assembled in Jaffa Gate to look at this sad sight. And now there's the uh, names and professions of the people that were hanged. Um, and these execution were uh, documented by uh, Palestinian photographer Khalil Raid, and we have the photograph. Um, um, now, what we know, at least one of these people, uh, and this is a, um, a Moroccan Jewish guy, Yosef Amuzir, who was a resident of Jerusalem, and he actually wasn't a deserter at all, but he didn't have the document to show that he uh, had a license to go. He was asked by his commander to go and bring something from Jerusalem, and he didn't have the document. And, and uh, this was an order by the commander of the fourth army, Jamal Pasha, find me a couple of Christians, a couple of Jews and a Muslim, I want to uh, deliver a message. Um, now, I think what is interesting about this kind of startling, and this is just one example, but startling description and how, I mean, it's almost never mentioned anywhere. Uh, there was an attempt by the families of those people to make them uh, uh, listed in the list of he Israeli heroes, uh, people that, um, for example, people that were hanged by the mandatory authorities are listed and commemorated. They are not, and there was a resistance to that. And that's partly part of a general amnesia of that kind of, that uh, uh, trauma, which was at the time meant prison, forced exile, deportations of tens of thousands and death and so forth. So I'll say, so why is this forgotten? I think there's one reason is of course, the traumas that come afterwards are enough. But for Palestinians, it's the Nakba. Uh, for Israeli Jews, is partly it's uh, the the uh, a price paid in the conflict, and and of, and of course we are talking about Israeli ca casualties as well. But it's also the Holocaust, was, which looms large, and therefore is forgotten. But also, I would say that uh, these kind of traumas are useful and resonant in the current political present and the, the last. And the, in the reality after 1917, uh, the World War One, with its kind of sense of betrayal by the Ottomans, and that that is not actually that useful, or was not particularly useful for the kind of political stories that 
happened after 1917, after the Balfour Declaration, which marked a kind of new beginning. So there is an anti-Ottoman sentiment, both in Arab nationalism and in Zionism, but it's actually not, it, it, it plays a minor role. Um, and I think that that is something, I think we, we know that memory is constructed and that does not to say that it's artificial, but certain things are highlighted responding to the kind of situations that we are. Someone who has uh, looked back at World War I and emphasized, and what, a lot of what I say is inspired by uh, 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 Salim Tamari, Palestinian historian, and this book is one that I rec recommend, The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, and he really emphasizes the significance of that moment, which is forgotten later. I will say one last thing, what is, and we, the, I think that uh, the, the, the context of the, the talk we mentioned uh, decolonization, the whole festival of ideas is around decolonization. What would decolonization mean when we talk about that? And I would say generally my approach, for me decolonization means a very, very simple thing, which is to shift the focus and the perspective to the local perspective. I think that is the first step to take that you have to pay attention to people, local people and how they view the situation. And when I teach World War I, there is a temptation, of course, when you talk about Palestine, World War I, you talk about Sykes-Picot and you talk about the Balfour Declaration and all the things that happened in London and Paris. It's very important for me to start discussion with Palestine and what a residence how residents see the situation, what were their hopes, what their horizons, and then how they understand what's coming next in terms of Sykes Picot and Balfour. Because if we do not start there, we replicate the colonial perspective. We continue to look at it through the colonial lens, even if we are critical about it. And just to end, I'll show you, can I share a picture? So I will share this picture. And this is the moment of the surrender of Jerusalem. And it's a familiar picture, 1917, December, the surrender of Jerusalem to the British. And what people usually miss when they look at this photograph is that this is not the British sophisticated army encountering uh, you know, the Jerusalem backwaters. This is a photograph that is directed, orchestrated, and staged by the Jerusalem mayor that you can see in the middle of the picture, Hossein Salim Hosseini. He gets the photographer to come along and to document this, uh, this event. He has agency. He has, this is the last moment that he has agency in that situation to dictate the historical record. And uh, Hosseini dies two weeks later from influenza, a very popular mayor. And understanding that local people have agency, have perspective is really, really important if we are to take seriously, I think this kind of whole idea of decolonization. I'll end here. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Again, lots of food for thought and I'm delighted that you talked about the Great War because that's something I like to think about as well. Um, I'd now like to invite Vikan, Vikan Chitarian to, um, uh, to present with his remarks, thank you. Thank you very much. So me, I will talk about uh, the influence and impact of Turkey on the Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So it's an on, ongoing subject. It, there's a war going on there uh, since September 27. And um, basically we have largely regarded um, the Karabakh conflict as part of Soviet and post-Soviet history, uh, which it is. Uh, so Karabakh is the result of Soviet policies of uh, defining uh, territories um, uh, based on ethnic belonging. And on top of this, they, they gave uh, you know, certain autonomies uh, being part of uh, ethnically defined nations. So Karabakh was an autonomous region with its Armenian majority but placed within um, Azerbaijan uh, Soviet Republic. So at the time of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, 
those tensions had to be resolved one way or another. But I will not develop on this point. I will look at another dimension uh, of the Karabakh conflict that is uh, largely absent from literature. And I will link it to what Yair was saying, going to the First World War uh, and to the Armenian genocide. Um, this is a major event taking place in the Middle East uh, within the Ottoman Empire. Um, Jamal Pasha was mentioned. He's one of the three in charge of the empire at the time, three who have committed uh, mass uh, deportations and massacres during which uh, the, the majority of Ottoman Armenians perished, but also other uh, non-Muslim communities, uh, especially the Assyrians. Uh, now, how, how can we link this, uh, this event, which took place in another uh, empire, in another zone, uh, how can we link it with the emergence of the Karabakh conflict? Well, from early on, it was present um, since uh, basically uh, the, the, um, the emergence of the, of the issue uh, as a political issue, the local Armenians demanded uh, to be um, detached from Soviet Azerbaijan and attached to uh, Soviet Armenia. And one week later, they were faced by pogroms in, in, in a different city in, in, in Azerbaijan, in Sungard. Um, and the pogroms were associated with, uh, with a political language that emerged in Azerbaijan that uh, links the view, the vision of this conflict to the vision uh, present in Turkey at the time, in Turkey of 1980s, a Turkey which had not recognized its crime of genocide, a Turkey which on the other hand, had developed a denialist uh, discourse. So, so what I will do now is, is to show how uh, such an event, uh, denied and censored for over a century, how it influenced the two actors of the conflict, the Armenians on the one hand and Azerbaijanis on the other hand. So this, this denialism has also uh, largely shaped Turkey and Turkish political culture and Turkish state institutions and Turkish public opinion. But I will not deal in, uh, in, in that here. Uh, you know, a lot has been said recently, a lot has been written recently on that. But what we have not taken into consideration is that this uh, largely censored, denied uh, trauma has found its way in a very strange way into the armenian azerbaijani conflict, into the Karabakh conflict. So to start with, uh, with the Armenians, uh, the, for the Armenians, the, the pogroms in, in Sungait and later similar pogroms in Kirovabad, today's Ganja, the second city of Azerbaijan, a year later in 1989, and then the pogroms in Baku in January 1990, for them, it was a reminder of the threat of annihilation. It was a reminder of the danger that the genocide can be repeated again. So this feeling pushed them into uh, a kind of existential angst and mobilization, seeing the Karabakh uh, struggle as uh, existential struggle that they had no other choice but to fight Azerbaijan, otherwise they uh, they were facing the threat of extermination. Um, later, the involvement of Turkey on the side of Azerbaijan, starting from 1992, uh, you might know that Turkey uh, refuses to establish diplomatic links with Armenia. Turkey refuses to open its border with Armenia. So the, the last portion of the Cold War border, Iron Curtain, still exists. It's the economic blockade that Turkey uh, has imposed in the last uh, three decades on Armenia. Plus, Turkey has taken, starting from 1993, a political position completely supporting Azerbaijan and opposing Armenia on the Karabakh question. So Turkey insists on, uh, on solving this problem from the perspective of Baku. 
And third element is, uh, is that Turkey has provided military aid in the past, as well as now, to Azerbaijan. Already in 1992, Turkey uh, bought large quantities of arms left behind by the, the Soviet army in East Germany and transferred to Azerbaijan in 92, 93. But today we see that Turkey is directly involved in the fighting, Turkish Air Force is there, uh, Turkey is, uh, is sending um, you know, Islamist mercenaries uh, from Syria and from elsewhere, uh, recruiting them and shipping them to Azerbaijan to take part in the conflict. So if, if we make a comparison with, uh, with the, the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, it's, it's like um, you know, 100 years after the, the, the Shoah, um, we have still a Germany uh, which is ruled by post-Nazi uh, elite. So we have a continuity between the, the Nazi uh, you know, party ruling Germany during the war and the, the party that emerged uh, in, in post Second World War Germany, the same people uh, ruling. Those, uh, this post-Nazi uh, elite does not recognize the Holocaust. Plus this uh, uh, you know, nationalist German elite uh, joins the, the, the Palestinian struggle uh, with uh, an Arab country, let's say a Basist uh, Syria, by sending the Luftwaffe, but also by recruiting former Nazi uh, fighters, military, recruiting them as mercenaries to ship them to take part in the struggle against Israel uh, in favor of, of the Palestinians. So my argument is that this kind of situation exists in the Caucasus, and this kind of situation is influencing the three actors, Turkey, Armenia and Azerbaijan. For Armenia, it reminds them of uh, you know, the danger of ex extermination by a neighbor who is there where we have elite continuity between those who perpetrated the genocide and those ruling Turkey today on the level of uh, discourse concerning the genocide. And they are actively supporting Azerbaijan on the question of the Karabakh conflict. Now I will take the second part, how this, uh, this Turkish participation has shaped Azerbaijani political culture. Now, as I said in the beginning, uh, the Armenian Azeri conflict has its roots in, in the Soviet arrangements. So uh, as well as Armenia, as well as Azerbaijan, they have perspectives to, to put forward. Azerbaijan emerged defeated in the first war. Azerbaijan has 600,000 internally displaced, has territories it's, it's, it lost in the war. So it has a lot to, to put forward in its discussions with Armenia. But Azerbaijan also adopted the denialist discourse that Turkey had in the 1980s and started seeing the Armenians, Armenians as illegitimate. They don't have the right to exist. They don't have the right to exist on the territory of the Caucasus, uh, Azerbaijani historiography and uh, elite have developed a discourse saying that the Armenians are newcomers. They were brought there by Russian colonialist forces. They are historically uh, an aberration. They don't have you know, the historical right to be there. Plus they see the Karabakh conflict as an existential struggle between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And by adopting this discourse, Azerbaijan developed a, dis a discourse of victimhood where Azeris are the victims of Armenian genocide. So the perpetrators become the Armenians and the victims become the Azerbaijanis. Uh, and this policy started in 1998 by, uh, by a law issued by the ruler of the time, Heydar Aliyev. And after this law, Azerbaijan started a state propaganda representing the Armenians as genocide perpetrators and Azerbaijanis as genocide victims. So there's, there's a law, there's uh, you know, days of commemoration 
where the Azerbaijani state spends lots of money in propaganda, uh, in doing propaganda in that, in that sense. There are museums to commemorate this uh, and so on. On the other hand, Azerbaijan became one of the most extreme deniers of the Armenian genocide. And they have become one of the obstacles in any attempt of uh, dialogue between Armenia and Turkey. For example, in 2008, there was an attempt by the presidents of Armenia, uh, Serge Sarkisian at the time, and uh, the president of, of Turkey, Abdullah Gül, to try to normalize the relations. It failed, and one of the major reasons was radical Azerbaijani opposition seeing any attempt of dialogue between Armenia and Turkey as a betrayal. So to make it short, Azerbaijan has developed uh, a political ideology which denies the existence of the other, denies the existence of the Armenian genocide, but in a very strange way has adopted the same narratives that touches the Armenian genocide, but uh, adopted a, a negative image of that, presenting Azerbaijani victimhood. Now to conclude, I will say that uh, the Karabakh conflict is one of the most complex conflicts because it adds uh, an ethno-territorial conflict that we inherited from the Soviet system from the moment of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, just like the conflict in Abkhazia, in Moldova, uh, in, in Chechnya and so on. But on top of that, we added the Arme Armenian-Turkish conflict, the unresolved conflict of the 1915 genocide, its consequences, and its denial. So this makes it incredibly complex and very difficult to resolve. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Viken. Thank you to all the speakers um, for some um, very stimulating uh, remarks, um, which I'm going to reflect on. I would just like to remind the audience, though, um, to start maybe putting together your questions. Your questions can be for um, any of the speakers individually or collectively, um, and anything to do with the theme of trauma, uh, history and memory. And as Yaya reminded us, and as I should have reminded us as chair, um, the, the wider theme of the festival is, um, is decolonization. And so maybe thinking about how these things um, relate to that issue. Um, I'm gonna say just a few remarks. I don't like always positioning myself biographically, but in this moment, I feel the need to respond biographically to some things which are going on. Um, and I mentioned this on Monday, at the opening event, um, which is the curious shape of the culture war in the present, in present day British discourse. Uh, I saw somebody showed me that a government minister in parliament had decried critical race theory and had declared that the government is unequivocally against critical race theory. And I was shocked, <laughs> I'm completely perplexed. I have an article coming out which literally says, this is about applying critical race theory to things. So I think this now makes me, however nicely I tried to play it, some kind of enemy of the state. Um, but this is, I mean, we're in such a absurd situation. Um, and this relates to the questions of history and trauma and memory, because as the decolonization debate has kind of unfurled in, spaces of education in culture and museums and we see the statues coming down and we see people on the streets and so on um, and the response of the state and particularly the government and specifically this government um, which is clearly influenced very heavily by the alt-right um, uh, discourse from America is this government I think is based on the rejection of trauma Right. So they see the attempts to decolonize culture and education as an attempt to reintroduce uh, a recognition of historical trauma or to introduce a recognition of historical trauma where previously there has only been denialism and triumphalism and generally kind of um, whitewashing. And it is it is the trauma or the traumatic question which is which is constantly rejected. Have you really experienced racism? Is it really a thing? Did people really not like British imperialism or so on? Um, and it's funny because it seems that the populist right at the moment is built on a kind of 
a jouissance, a kind of enjoyment of life, right? Trump's whole thing is about enjoying himself. He's putting his fingers up to the elite and he's putting his fingers up to the scientists and so on. And he's going out there and he looks like he's having a good time. And Boris is looking like he's having a good time and he's enjoying, you know, teasing his opponents and so on. Um, and the entire construction of the right is, is, is about the rejection of the idea that we should be traumatized. And that's clearly very attractive and it has some kind of appeal, right? Even all of the nonsense of Brexit, what people heard was, we are not going to be victims anymore, right? That was the message that came out of that whole situation. Um, yet profoundly, as you know, as we know from our critical race theorist friends and, and others that um, empire is a continuing wound in Britain, right? It is, um, it is the constitutive integral part of it. And just as these triumphalist discourses are pushing forward, um, the, if you like, the victims of uh, England's imperialism are starting to tear away, right? So Scotland is starting to back off and even Northern Ireland, we have questions now about the integrity of the, uh, the union there. Um, so the very, ironically, the very nature of that triumph is destroying the interconnecting tissue of, <laughs> the, of Britain, perhaps. Um, so that's one set of thoughts. So, but then I asked myself the question really, because then you have the other thing, which is the victimhood. So one of the things that's happening in the rejection of critical race theory is the rejection of the idea of white privilege, right? It's the idea that because white people can be disadvantaged, therefore there's no such thing as white privilege essentially seems to be the argument. Um, and that to call people racist is is the bigger is the bigger insult. Anyway, so these these questions lead me to think about how and to what extent can trauma or the rejection of trauma be a basis for a liberationist kind of politics? Um, and I would situate this not just in the questions around Britain, but um, my own background as a as a Sri Lankan Tamil. Obviously, um, uh, Sri Lankan Tamils have endured huge conflict, displacement, ethnic cleansing. Um, and uh, and many have claimed the label genocide for what happened, um, you know, the mass killing of Tamils um, in, in the north. But I've always been uncomfortable with the constant focus on the trauma as the central node in the politics, partly because there's the stratification within, let's say, the Tamil community, which means that particular leaders are able to mobilize trauma for particular ends and actually to shut down other pathways. So once you have trauma, can you have dialogue, right? Once you have trauma, can you have um, resolution? Is the only end game a kind of separation? Is that the only way to deal with trauma? Um, and what does it mean? What? How can we envisage a politics which can accept and sit with trauma as a necessary integral part of the historical experience, but which is not defined only and always by traumatic events or particular periods. Um, and I would echo what Yair said, I think it's interesting, and you see this a lot in diaspora politics, often diasporas are more radicalized and more traumatized than those who stay, because those who stay are engaging in the everyday kind of means of survival and they need to get by in various kinds of ways. In some respects, they're being more, um, they're being more um, pragmatic than those who sit afar and are traumatized doubly by the violence, but also then by their by their exile. Uh, maybe these thoughts are um, not useful, but I would be interested to hear what the, the panel had to say. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming through, but I'm gonna let them collect a bit. So maybe I'll come back to, um, our panelists for just a couple of responses either to each other or things that they wanted to add maybe just two or three minutes each and then I will go to the to the audience okay so I'll maybe start with uh, Gilbert if that's okay thank you thank you Mira uh yeah well some uh, few uh, quick uh, quick comments um uh, on on uh, what uh, what Yair uh, explained, which uh, uh, I found uh, quite interesting, 
uh, I want to say that uh, in Lebanon, the uh, memory of the famine and all that is there. It's in the history and uh, people know about that. And the memory of Ottoman oppression is very much there. The, the, the major square in uh, Beirut is called the Martyr Square. These are martyrs martyred by the Ottomans, not uh, anything else, you know. So this history is very, very much there. Uh, if it is not for the Palestinians, very much part of, uh, of the, let's say, active memory, although, of course, historians and all that would know about it, uh, it is because, as you said, they, they had a much bigger trauma, which was this, this uprooting from, from, their, uh, from their land, from their country. And that's it. And I, I think that on this level, we, we can't, if, I mean, you, you can't also draw uh, here uh, any, I think, comparison with when you say Jews, well, uh, the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews uh, uh, were not, I mean, their ancestors were not in Palestine at the time of the Great Famine. Oh, okay, so I wonder what proportion of, of, of people were, uh, uh, I mean, descend from families which were already there and could have, therefore, uh, any kind of uh, memory of that. On the issue of um, what Viken said, uh, Viken, I think the, the analogy you, you, you gave is uh, unfortunate, to be frank with you. I mean, this analogy with that, I mean, because it, it doesn't work like this. Uh, Armenia uh, uh, and Azerbaijan are not in the relation of Israel and the Palestinians, right? Israel, we are speaking of decolonizing here. Israel, Israel is a colonial fact, is a set, settler colonial state, which is not the case uh, of what you, you were mentioned. Actually, the, the, the Azeris see the Karabakh as some kind of uh, of attempt at you know at some settler I mean Armenian settler colonialism in their own land or that. so that's a different story, and if you want to take the kind of analogy that you had well you had a German state with a post Nazi elite, which was West Germany had a lot of uh, former Nazis in it I mean Hannah Arendt and all that uh, have uh, very much commented on these issues, and uh, this state well did not. Uh, help the Palestinian, but it had the, the, the Zionist movement, it had the Israel. Uh, actually, can point to a very interesting book that came out recently by uh, a SOAS alumni. It's based on that uh, SOAS PhD thesis, which is uh, called Whitewashing and State Building on uh, German Israeli relations. So I think that the, you should handle analogies with, with more care, eh? because here, this one, I think, is not, uh, is not fortunate. Otherwise, of course, well, everything you said was very interesting. Uh, um, and finally, I, I should say that, uh, Mira, it's uh, quite good that you, you, you spoke because being, bringing the British issue in this uh, discussion was absolutely crucial. And uh, not only through history, Balfour or um, colonial mandate in Palestine, but also what's going on, which is very much related. I mean, this, this denial, denial of, of the colonial uh, legacy, this uh, this uh, this uh, willingness, which you see at, at various level, including uh, the, the the way uh, uh, the, the the government uh, that was under Theresa May uh, celebrated the the hundredth uh, anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, for instance, you know, without any regard to the the victims in that uh, in that conflict. So that's very much that. But on the key question that you 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 mentioned on trauma and referring to your own experience. Uh, of, of Sri Lanka, with which I'm, I happen to be uh, quite familiar, actually. Uh, I think that for like any traumas, uh, th there is no way to suppress the trauma unless you acknowledge it. That's like in psychoanalysis or whatever. You can't suppress it by denying it. And that's the problem. That's, that's, that's why denial is at the core of everything we are discussing, you know. And that's why I try to explain in, in my book on the, the Arabs and the Holocaust that the, the, the condition for any real dialogue leading to a real peace is a mutual recognition of each other's trauma, okay? Now, even though the Palestinians uh, <clears throat> were not at all uh, uh, perpetrators in, in, the, in the Holocaust, the, the, the acknowledgement of what it means for uh, those of the Israelis who, and there are many of them who are survivors or 
descendant of survivors, is very important to establish a dialogue. But more crucial even from there is the, 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 the recognition on the, on the Israeli side of the historical injustice and the, the ongoing oppression of the Palestinians. That's the, the, the key point. So without this mutual recognition uh, and the end of denial, denial by the Israeli state of the Nakba uh, in particular, then uh, there is no possible peace in my view. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring in Yaya now. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer to uh, Gilbert's comments and also to my comments in his talk. I mean, I feel so you're of course right that most Israelis, uh, their families came after 48 um, and so forth. So there is not family or the family relation to anyone that was in Palestine in 1917 is, is, is limited. But if you look at the way that the 1929 events are commemorated in Israel, Again, I mean, again, there's no family relations, but it is understood as part of the nation's history. And that's, that's, that's it's kind of a, you know, a, a, and, that, and, and that kind of connection is made. It's not made towards the people I discussed, which is a decade earlier. So it is an imagined con connection in many ways and it's in that sense, but, uh, um, you know, you could, you could think of Israel-Palestine in which these people are commemorated, okay? Because it's a question of who you choose for your national narrative. Um, I very much welcome, I think, that uh, uh, um, uh, Gilbert's work in general, and specifically the kind of thinking through these connections, because I think as Gilbert said, I mean, there's, you could say, well, why do we need this, right? I mean, why when we say, talk about West Bank, colonization, why do we need to even mention the, you know, the Holocaust or anything like that? And uh, we can just talk in the language of international law, right? People say, don't single out Israel. No, okay, no, we don't. We just want to use the language of international law and not discuss it. I think, so it can work to the extent, but I think on some level it cannot work. I mean, I think it is so fun foundational uh, first to Israel, but also um, Israel's relations with the Jewish diaspora. And the Jewish diaspora as a racialized minorities around the world that is very much, you know, produced and impacted by the Holocaust. And then therefore, if you want to take it seriously, if you want to analyze it seriously, you need to take uh, the Holocaust into the account. And, uh, and I think that's important. Uh, one thing that Gilbert said that, uh, that you know what it's important because of course there is historical connection and uh, 48 comes three years after 45 and we can doubt whether without second world war there would be an Israeli state uh, and, and so forth but it's also worth mentioning that without the conditions that produce the Holocaust which is at least in part the anti-semitism in Europe, there would be no Zionism as a force. So even if we go backwards and say Zionism starts in 1880s, yes, but this ex it starts exactly because of European anti-Semitism. So that's why you cannot really take anti-Semitism out of the account. It produces this uh, uh, situation constantly. And the last thing I would say is that it's true. And again, we are not comparing the two traumas, I think. It's a very, all the different traumas are all uh, in their account. I think it's true that, uh, you know, the Holocaust as an event of state Nazi violence ends in 45. Uh, and that is, you know, important to say. While if we talk about Palestinian situation and Palestinian experience of displacement is continuous and, and, and repression and so forth. So in that sense, I accept that. Um, but I would also say that these historical traumas, even when they end, they do not really end. So they continue to work, they continue to reverberate. In this case, the absence of Jews in Europe, in much of Europe, uh, uh, it continues to be a, a force that actually uh, continues to condition re relations. Uh, we don't have state violence as such, but we don't have necessary state recognition in some states in Eastern Europe. 
and we have events like uh, you know um, cemeteries being vandalized, and that is uh, that is a you know this is a statement that your dead will not be safe here. It's not that we you've ki we have killed you, but your dead even will not be safe in this continent which is something that continues, uh, it's a haunting experience. And it's not unique, I think, to the Holocaust. In many cases, traumas, even after the situation stabilizes and so forth, and there is some kind of resolution, these things remain as a wound, as a scar. And it's something, and in specifically in Israel, Palestine, I do think it continues to work in various ways and we should be uh, aware of that. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll just, maybe one more thing, and, and about the Armenian genocide and the way it works in, in Jerusalem. And this is something that uh, Armenian uh, ceramic art is very popular in Jerusalem, very popular among Israelis and Jews and the Palestinians. And there's a fantastic book by Sato Moralian. But only when I read this book, I understood that this is an art of genocide. Its very existence in Jerusalem is the product of the gen Armenian genocide. It wouldn't be there on that scale, if it, if there wasn't, a, so it's a very sad and beautiful presence. And I think this is to, to see how the Armenian genocide uh, shaped our landscape. I think is is in Israel Palestine is also a, interesting to think about it. Uh, and thank you, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Viken, please feel free to pick up on any of the, the comments or the issues um, raised. Yeah, thank you, Gilbert. It, it, it was an analogy. I didn't mean to, to make uh, parallelism between two very complex histories. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to underline uh, is that um, on a ethno-territorial conflict in the Caucasus, where two sides had issues uh, to discuss with each other after the ceasefire of 94. Uh, the, um, the addition of this denialist genocidal vision from the side of Azerbaijan has exacerbated this, uh, this conflict and made the, the possibility of debate impossible. Um, I will not go to the others. Uh, co concerning to Yair, yeah, what, what uh, you just mentioned about the ceramics who, uh, who are families who came from Kutahia in Turkey, uh, dynasties uh, for generations they were working in this domain. Uh, I want to say that um, the history of the Armenian genocide uh, has been for long censored, not just by the state of Turkey only, but also on the level of academia, but also on the level of history of the Middle East. Me, I think the history of the Middle East modern history of the Middle East, post-Ottoman history of, of the Middle East, will be enriched a lot if we include this experience in our consideration of uh, historical narrative. There's a number of issues that we haven't addressed. And is, you know the roots goes back to the moment of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the mass violence the state exercised on its population and so on. Um, now, trauma and dialogue, yes, it's possible. But the precondition, as, as Gilbert said, is that the perpetrator recognizes. Uh, in the case of the Armenian genocide, the perpetrator for 100 years and plus tried first to censor, to uh, take out any mention of not only the, the mass violence, but of any mention of the victims. So the victims, after being uh, exterminated physically, they were excluded from geography, from history, from culture, from, from uh, public discussion. And the last point that I want to, to make is that this is the case of Turkey. This has conditioned Turkish history. So you can have mass violence, mass, mur mass murder and denial, but history will keep remembering. And history is remembering in a very strange way uh, by the reemergence of this issue uh, in the form of the Karabakh conflict. Me, I'm convinced that the Karabakh conflict could have been resolved through these discussions, through negotiations, through dialogue, but uh, adding the, the, the very heavy, very intense history of denial of the, of the mass violence of 1915 is making any dialogue impossible today. Thank you. Thank you, Vikan. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because um, 
it's one of the things that I think outsiders can't understand. And so when you get these efforts to mediate conflict and you get these people trotting down from the UN or from Oslo or wherever the negotiators uh, come from, um, and just being really unable to understand how and why things become non-negotiable, right? So things like trauma, things like uh, the recognition of a historical event, right? You know, which is on one level in the past, um, become absolute non-negotiables in, in, in these situations. Um, and it's one of those, you know, questions, things that makes things intractable. Um, anyway, so I won't uh, dwell on that. What I would like to do now is, um, I'll maybe say a few words, but we will go to the audience. Um, what I'm going to do in terms of the chat, so we've got a few questions in the Q&A. There have also been some questions here in the um, chat box, and I'm not really sure who can and can't see the chat box. So I'm going to ask, um, uh, so I'm going to read out some of the questions from the chat box. We'll take them in batches. Um, so if you still want to ask questions, you can do. Um, but I'll take them in a few batches and, and hopefully the audience will forgive me that um, I will summarize some of the questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, so one, um, I think quite a straightforward question from Khadija saying, um, if this is a discussion on history, memory and trauma under decolonization, why is it only the Middle East and Eastern Europe slash Asia, Asia and, and essentially not the other regions, Africa or India, Pakistan? Um, we have a question from um, Manuel in uh, the chat box, uh, noting um, that 800,000 Jews were expelled from the Arab states and now they are the majority in Israel. Um, and so the dispossession of the Mizrahi Jews uh, being one of the traumas that shapes uh, the Jewish population in Israel. Um, and uh, uh, the third question I'll take for now is the question on transitional justice as a means for processing trauma and reaching some kind of justice or reconciliation. What role can formal justice mechanisms or formal transitional justice mechanisms play? Where do they fall short? And can these tools be imposed by outside actors? Often they are imposed by outside actors. Can they be decolonized, right? So three things there, the, um, uh, the geographical focus, the um, trauma of the Mizrahi Jews, and this question about transitional uh, justice. Um, I think I might start by saying a few words about transitional uh, justice mechanisms. And this is a huge um, area which uh, I've spent some time thinking about in the context of Mozambique. So Mozambique is interesting. Um, if you think African conflicts that were sort of ending in the early 90s, um, uh, Lynn Grable put a little article together called Pardon, Punish, Amnesia, and it was looking at Mozambique, Rwanda and South Africa, all had been through uh, traumatic war, violence um, and the fall of apartheid. Um, South Africa chose a sort of Truth and Reconciliation Commission approach. In Rwanda, you had a lot of trials, national trials, international trials in the local kind of gachacha courts. And in Mozambique, you had nothing, right? You had an amnesty law and public amnesia about everything that had happened in the war, even though a million people had died and uh, more had been displaced. What was interesting is about that is that I think on one level they all worked and, that, and on one level they all didn't work. In Mozambique, you actually had a kind of peace that held between the warring parties uh, for 15, 20 years um, or more and which only broke down when the failure of the elites to kind of share the spoils of the state kind of um, worked out. At a public level though, it's not clear that the w people wanted to remember the war because to remember the war was to invite it back in to their lives. Actually, people had ceremonies where they sort of removed the war from the community by, by purifying the community afterwards. Um, and it's a very different approach to the idea that we have to talk things through to, um, to resolve them. What is the effect of that? It's unclear whether there has been any negative effect of it. I mean, I'm sure people who have suffered from the war have personally suffered PTSDs and all, all the rest of it, but um, has the body politic suffered by failing to reckon with the war in a big public way? I find it difficult to say that it has. 
I think on one level in Mozambique, at least with this case that I'm familiar with, the, the desire for the war to be over, not just in a sort of physical sense, but also in a mental sense of the desire for the war to be over was so strong that the amnesia was sort of a relief in a way. Um, in South Africa, in Rwanda, I mean, these are longer stories to tell, which I won't tell now, but um, there's at least been some evidence that in Rwanda, you know, the, the meeting out of punishment whilst necessary has also been heavily kind of politicized um, and is leading to kind of suppression of the opposition now. Uh, South Africa, yes, we have success on one level, um, but also the, the rejection of a lot of that settlement in the present. So anyway, um, hopefully that's some, <laughs> some answer to, to Claire's question. Um, I'll come back to Gilbert and uh, the other panelists for um, responses on the other two points. Or maybe I'll just say that, sorry, the geographical thing is, um, I think this is just the people that we had to speak to uh, areas that they were knowledgeable about. But I think um, in general, we would recognize that these dynamics cross continents and borders um, and in the metropole as well as elsewhere. Gilbert. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, this issue of the Mizrahi Jews, uh, or let's put it more uh, clearly, the, the Jews uh, from Arab countries. This is a very classical argument when you discuss uh, this, uh, this issue, uh, except that it belongs to the same logic uh, that uh, would uh, explain or justify uh, uh, the uh, Israeli uh, state and the Zionist project by uh, Nazism and what the Nazis did uh, to the Jews. Because otherwise, uh, then you are basing it on some racial view that because you have Arab states, then the Palestinians bear a responsibility in what Arab states do, even though they don't bear no responsibility in what Germans do. No, it doesn't work like this. Even if all Arab Jews had been expelled uh, after, and that, by the way, would have happened after 1948, after the creation of the State of Israel, even if that happened, this is no justification to what happened to the Palestinians. And the Palestinians have no responsibility in what any Arab state do. That's number one. Number two uh, is that the major instance of expulsion of uh, Jews from Arab country is that of Iraq. That was done by a government closely linked to Britain. And that was done with the complicity of the Israeli state and the great happiness of the Zionist movement. And that's why Iraqi Jews resent this uh, exodus that they suffered, and they did, were not happy at all uh, with uh, finding themselves in Israel. For the rest, Moroccan Jews were not expelled. Yemeni Jews were not expelled. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 I mean, the story of presenting all Arab Jews that went into Israel as expelled is not, uh, is not true, in, including my own country in Lebanon. I, 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 at school, I had a lot of, uh, of uh, Jewish uh, uh, classmates, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm speaking of a time that uh, changed after 1967, and that uh, after that you had an exodus, and they didn't, um, the, the vast majority didn't go to, to Israel. They went to Canada, they went to, to North America. And that's the case, actually, with the overwhelming majority of, of European Jews, when the, if they had the choice, they would have the overwhelming majority of them went anyhow to North America, but even those who ended up in Palestine would have chosen to do that. Uh, and uh, just a final point, just to, 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 to so that uh, we can, or maybe also, uh, uh, Yair uh, comment, uh, actually the Israeli, uh, the, the Zionist institution, I'm not speaking of all Israelis, of course, and especially not Yair here, uh, but the, the, the Zionist institution actually practiced denial of other genocides like the Armenian. I mean, the, 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 the Israeli state would had very close connection with the Turkish state and still has, and in Azerbaijan, the, the major source of, of armament of Azerbaijan is Israel. So it is actually complicit in, you know, in, in, a, in, in helping uh, the denial side uh, in this conflict. And this is also something that, that uh, you know, should be uh, reflected upon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Yair. 
Um, I'll just say that on the um, on the regional issue, I mean, I think I wish we did have uh, also from the in, uh, subcontinent or from Africa, I think it would have been uh, really, really interesting. Sometimes we discuss these things separately. Uh, we have to be attentive to context, but also a lot of times there's shared colonial logic. Um, so I think, for example, it is important to discuss partition in Israel Palestine and India Pakistan together. These are very different contexts, but for British colonial officials that kind of navigate th these situations, they don't necessarily understand the differences or they don't see the differences and they recommend sim similar policies, um, which result in, in similar results to some degree. So it doesn't, doesn't do, it's not to equate them, but I think there are, there are connections. I mean, especially when I think of uh, partition in India, Pakistan and in, in Palestine, which happened more or less at the same time, we cannot really. So it is productive and it is of course productive to think about differences. Um, that's uh, one thing. I mean, transitional uh, transition justice. I think in Israel, Palestine, we are very far from that uh, point where we can uh, when we can talk in these terms. Uh, I think, though, the infrastructure is there in the sense of, in terms of knowledge and in terms of academic work and so forth. And I would say that if we get to the pol different political environment, then things may be easier than we think. But it's not that people are ignorant. I mean, people or people sometimes say things that they know better. But you know, you are in a heat of the situation, and you are locked in that uh, situation, and, and especially in the moment where it's not clear what the political horizons are. Uh, I think it's difficult, but, uh, and it's difficult to speak in these terms uh, now. On the question of Mizrahi Jews, I would just say that we have to, we can go into this uh, histories and narratives and so forth. Uh, we have to recognize that for the vast majority of them that ended up in Israel, this is not a, this was never a pure choice. Some of them were more kind of willing to, uh, to, to do it, and some of them at, at all not, but it was not a you know it was not a pure choice of someone that wakes up in the morning and ends up in a state, and that produces trauma for also for the, these communities. And I think we can, uh, uh, and I think that this has to be taken you know into consideration, not in a simple equation, but in in. So recognizing that on the Israeli on the Israeli Jewish side, practically every most of the population ended up in Israel not out of pure choice. Let's just, let's, let's put it this way, uh, which is also to some degree in tension with the Zionist narrative, of course, that is about a, a choice, a decision. Uh, and I think part of, and part of the problem is, I mean. When, was mentioned that they make up most of the population in Israel. The, the, the reality is that we cannot say this for sure and uh, because the Israeli um, census and statistics refuse to take this, refuse to collect this information for third generation because these things are actually quite sensitive in Israeli society. There's, you know, these hi there's hierarchies within Israeli societies that, uh, you know, uh, continue to uh, be operative in the case of Mizrahi versus Ashkenazi Jews. And that, uh, so in a way, I think it's, it's uh, it, we, we would be better in a situation where these things are discussed openly uh, in Israel and, and the state would actually take responsibility for its role in marginalizing these communities as well. Alain. Thank you. Um, Biken. Yes, to, to pick up what Gilbert said about Israel and the current conflict in Karabakh, Israel indeed is a player in the conflict, militarily, um, because Israel is one of the major sources of armament for Azerbaijan. Uh, some uh, Israeli uh, reports uh, reveal that last year, Azerbaijan imported 61% uh, of, of its total uh, arms imports from Israel. And, and these include very sophisticated drones, surface-to-surface -surface missiles, and so on. 
but this could also link to, to the other question, uh, which is uh, genocide, recognition, trauma. And indeed, Israel is, from this perspective, from the perspective of the Armenian genocide, it's a denialist state. Israel uh, rejects the idea that uh, apart from the Holocaust, there's any other comparable, comparable event that can be qualified as genocide under the UN's definition of genocide. So Israel has uh, rejected this terminology and resists the idea of equating or in any way, a legal way or, or doing historical comparisons between these two experiences. And I wonder whether there's any uh, link between uh, denialism of the, of the genocide and the active military cooperation with Azerbaijan. Um, I want to, to talk about transitional justice in the context of the Armenian genocide issue. And indeed, in, uh, in the last decade, uh, during moments when Turkish politics was moving towards more liberal positions, um, there was an, no, an opening within Turkey and for the first time, uh, 80 uh, years after the genocide, there were the first debates, the first books published. 90 years after the genocide, there was the first uh, academic conference in Istanbul uh, where the term genocide was used. And, um, and yes, this dialogue is possible. Uh, and this dialogue is, um, is, is not just a service that uh, a community belonging to the perpetrators does to the to the others, but this is a service that they do for their own community. Uh, I will take the other argument: why denialism is still important for Turkey. Uh, what does it mean for the Turkish state to deny the Armenian genocide? The Armenians are not there anymore. <laughs> they practically don't exist, apart from a very small minority in Istanbul. Well, the state denies because the state is saying. I did it in the past, I don't assume responsibility, and I'm ready to do it again. And minorities in Turkey, uh, when you talk to the Kurds in Turkey, they recognize this very well. And the, 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 the intellectuals, the political forces that are struggling for recognition, they are struggling not just for any kind of historical luxury, but as a way to defend themselves by having a society where crime is recognized as a crime as a first step to, to stop it from repeating in the future. Thank you, Viken. Um, yeah, lots of food for thought there. One thing which I'm thinking about as you're all speaking is, um, is about the symbolic nature of acknowledgement and recognition versus what we might think of as more material reparations and which of these things might matter more in the context of moving forward? Um, you know, is it more important to recognize, say, the Armenian genocide um, and, you know, have it historically recorded? Or is, you know, the reparation of money or land or whatever to the Armenians a key thing? I mean, so I'm just going to leave that question floating there. I'll pull in a few more from the audience. Um, so Laika asks, do you think a, a gendered approach should be integral to the reconstruction of memory and, and what would gender bring to us? I think that's one um, really fascinating question to open up. Um, we have a couple of maybe more factual questions, um, which are uh, one I would invite Yaya to answer in the in text um, about the factual details of the Jerusalem executions and whether this comes up in the book. Um, from Jihad and one from Daniel asking about what is Iran's position in relation to the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict? Uh, does it influence it? Does it recognize the genocide and so on? And uh, two more questions which I'll throw out to the panel. One uh, is to Yair to um, say when we talk about decolonization and shifting focus to the local perspective, I guess how do we deal with the people who have been displaced or migrated if they are no longer local in that? in that sense um and uh one i suppose is about the question of political dislike of religion driving war um i guess to what extent is religious hatred driving war from from isha um okay uh does anyone want to tackle the
question of gender and the reconstruction of uh, memory. I'll say a few words. Oh, mm -hmm. you right? Okay, sure. Go ahead. No, we can. You wanted to say something? No, I mean, very quickly. Uh, the, the, of course, there is a huge deficit in uh, approaching uh, issues uh, from the gender perspective. Uh, all these conflicts that we are discussing, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of uh, attention paid to, to this, the, the gender dimension has been relatively limited, although it's not completely absent, of course, uh, because in, in the, the, the description of, of traumas and all that, uh, the, 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 this is uh, uh, taken into account. When you discuss refugees, you are also, you, you have the, the, I mean, it's also a very much a gender issue that uh, speaking of refugees, especially when you have uh, uh, refugees after a genocide where, where uh, males have been uh, uh, slaughtered. And, and so that gives it in itself also a, a, a gender uh, dimension. But uh, this is, uh, I would say, I, I mean, I can't, I don't see that in, impacting the, the topic itself, except from the point of view of, of maybe, uh, I mean, the role of, uh, of women in, uh, in these instances is, is crucial because uh, they, uh, I mean, uh, they tend to, uh, uh, to, to be better at uh, establishing the real dialogue and uh, moving towards uh, the, the, the issues that we mentioned, recognition and the rest. Uh, better than, than males, I mean, speaking in general terms. And uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, that's what I, I can say in a very few words about uh, this, uh, this issue. But uh, indeed, as in many, many aspects, we are very much lagging behind. And this, the gender perspective is, is being constructed fr uh, from re relatively recent period in history. And uh, that should definitely uh, carry on. Thank you. I mean, I think maybe I would just add to that, that one of the um, interesting gender dynamics that maybe makes a number of these conflicts intractable is the gendered character of the nation. And often when um, there has been either symbolic or actual sexual violence in conflict, um, this makes, well, this is, you know, this is a trauma squared right so it is not just a violence it's not just the termination of life but in some sense it's absolute degradation it's absolute um, abasement and so um, when we try to think about how would we work through a situation of you know damage and innocence and victimhood and so on um, once you bring in sexual violence it raises the you know the stakes are raised so highly because of the place of uh, patriarchy and understanding how how the integrity of the person is to be maintained and therefore the integrity of the nation. So um, mm. these things become very difficult. Um, it is interesting that not all conflicts have the same kinds and varieties of sexual violence. Like some conflicts have, it's, it's incredibly widespread. It, it becomes kind of weaponized and um, used strategically in others it plays very little role at all. And I think in, um, and there's a wide literature, I'd really recommend um, Spike Peterson's work on um, the gendered economies of war and how the symbolic, the productive and the reproductive orders of war are all kind of heavily gendered. Um, and I think that gives some insight into how the mechanics of war and peacemaking themselves are, are inflected by it. Okay. Yeah. And just just to, to add an illustration of what I was saying about the role of women in, in uh, peacemaking and all that, we see it in the formations of, you know, like women in black, uh, uh, mothers and all that. So this is, uh, I mean, this is a dimension, I think is very, this dimension is very important in peacemaking. And uh, the, 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 the more the, the role of women is, I mean, the higher the, the, their input is, the, the more you can have uh, some progress towards uh, resol conflict resolution. I think this is uh, quite uh, quite uh, important. This time, I mean, we we we, the, the, we we think when we think of gender, we think of the, the 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 trauma, the tragedy, and all that. But we have also to think of the gender perspective in conflict resolution. That's I think quite quite uh, important. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, this is a really interesting uh, 
big topic. Um, but one of the one of the key issues, I suppose, that comes out again when looking at the role of women in war and post-war uh, conflicts is um, because women are so often involved in the sort of daily acts of survival, the production of food, the care of children and the um, vulnerable and so on. Um, it requires women to insert themselves into society in a kind of different way, right? To play a different role, um, to make different kinds of um, connections. And so there's a, there's a lot of feminist peace theory which tries to use, if you like, the intimacy of the roles that women play as a basis for peacemaking or alternative memory making and so on. I'll move now to uh, Yaya Viken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just say about gender. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, these things work in a kind of subconscious way, right? So, and that's why I think it's important to, you know, to be aware of it and also to, for, uh, um, for example, I talked about World War I trauma and I gave a specific case of, I, I, so I talked about conscription of males and I talk, gave an example of five men that, that were hanged. I, and I had 10 minutes and that kind of the things that came out to me when I was making a list. Uh, but I could have also spoken about prostitution widely uh, practiced in Jerusalem during the war year, at least partly driven by destitution of women and uh, and, uh, and, and and being in, in difficult circumstances. And I talked about the people that were executed, but I could have mentioned at least one fam one mother and that, uh, of one of these uh, soldiers committed suicide and that tried to commit suicide. So these things that I think if a woman was telling the story would probably maybe look at different things. And that's why I think it's important first to be aware of these things. And, and second, I think we all, we can see that, that the things we pick are sometimes subconscious about experiences that are more relatable to us because of our gender or ethnicity and so forth. Um, I'm just saying that kind of there was a question of what does it mean in terms of uh, you know what I said about about shifting the perspective to local people. It means, for example, if we're talking about refugees, then we we start with refugee experiences. We don't start with the UN officials that try to kind of manage the situation. We don't start with the politicians that are kind of again managing. Which we start with people's own experience. I think that's the kind of. Uh, um, that's the kind of insight that, that I was trying to communicate. It's very, for me as a historian, when I talk about 1917, it's, it's, I think it's particularly important because the temptation is, is so uh, strong to shift the, to the perspective to the imperial perspective. But by this, we are erasing the people on the ground that had their own ambitions, plans, horizons, hopes. Uh, and by deleting them from from the discussion, we make them passive, you know, spectators of history, and that is a colonial, colonial perspective by by definition. That's what I was trying to communicate. Of course, when refugees are, I continue to be part of the picture, but and I think it's important to give, to listen to their voice and and and, and listen to their agency within, specifically in Israel, Palestine, but also in other contexts. We can. On the gender dimension, um, I think the, the gender dimension in the case of the Armenian genocide can be compared to, to the Yazidi experience with Daesh. Men executed, women enslaved. Uh, hundreds of thousands of women, young girls, uh, also boys were kidnapped, uh, exploited sexually, adopted in families, and then their memory was censored. Uh, many, many, uh, probably several million today in Turkey have ancestry. Very often it's a grandmother. Uh, very often this grandmother was kidnapped uh, before becoming part of the family. And uh, only in, in the last 10, 15 years, this issue emerged in Turkey. Uh, the first book being that of Fethiye Çetin, uh, the the lawyer, the human rights militant, 
uh, who wrote a book about her grandmother. The title is My Grandmother, uh, that um, um, kind of narrates the story where she discovered the history, very tragic history of her grandmother. Uh, so yes, the, the, the gender dimension in the event is very strongly there and, and probably part of it um, echoes in the Yazid experience. About recognition or reparation in the case of Armenian genocide, I think for the Armenians recognition is primordial. It's, it's, the, it's the most important. The, the rest is just details, it's not important because by recognition, Armenia would receive the guarantee that Turkey will not threaten Armenia anymore. Armenia and the Armenians. So these days, the Armenian community in Istanbul, they are harassed regularly, regularly and they fear for their uh, safety. So for Armenians, recognition would mean that Turkey recognizes that in the past it committed a crime against Armenians and will not commit similar violence again. Uh, so it's a security guarantee. And I think for minorities in, Tur in Turkey, it has the same sense. Um, now about Iran and the conflict in Karabakh, I think Iran is in a very difficult situation. Uh, Iran is very unhappy to see uh, a NATO army being established on its northern borders. The presence of uh, Turkish military uh, aviation uh, generals in, in, in Azerbaijan today. To, uh, Iran is very worried about Israeli military presence uh, in Azerbaijan. And Iran is very uh, worried to see, uh, you know, uh, Islamist, Sunni, Jihadi uh, elements now being deployed in Azerbaijan. But at the same time, Iran, for Iran, the events are very delicate. The Iranian regime is not very popular these days in Iran, probably you have noticed that. And Iran has a very large uh, Azeri speaking uh, ethnic uh, community in Northwest Iran. And uh, there has been at least twice demonstrations in Tabriz and other cities in the North of Iran in favor of Azerbaijan. So on the one hand, Iran is not happy with the military and geopolitical de developments. On the other hand, Iran is very careful with the events in, in the Caucasus. Thank you, it's very um, comprehensive. Um, and yeah, yeah, maybe you can answer the question um, about the executions in the, in the little Q and A box. I don't know if you can see that. Um, okay, so we're coming towards the end of our, our session um, and I think we've managed to deal with most of the um, questions. So um, I think I will um, ask our panelists if they want to say anything um, to, uh, to wrap up on this broader question of history more trauma memory. I mean, these are massive issues um, and I think we've just managed to unpick a little um, in a few cases of how these things operate and how they shape uh, the political uh, present. Um, so maybe I will start with, um, with Viken. Um, Viken to um, just say a couple of words if you would like by way to um, give the audience something to take home. Um, yes, me, me, I think when, when we debate mass, tra mass trauma, uh, mass violence, genocide in the past, very often we talk about uh, the communities that suffered, uh, the victimized communities. Which, which is important, but I think we should also pay attention to what is happening on the other level, what is happening to states, state institutions, institutional memory. And, and I think this is extremely important because we see that when we have uh, states and institutions that took part in, uh, in mass violence, and when after those events, uh, they do not draw a clear line between the past experience and the present, uh, states keep the memory of mass violence and they keep it as sometimes positive memory, as, an, as uh, instruments, toolkits to be used when they are confronted with, uh, with other conflicts and tend to reuse mass violence. And I think this, the struggle to, to debate and to, to raise these issues is not just a struggle to defend past victims, it's a struggle to defend uh, and, and to stop future perpetration of mass violence. Is, is, is a struggle to defend the future from states that might uh, be still uh, you know, remembering uh, past violence 
and even considering it as a heroic act, you know, celebrating mass violence. And I think we should also shift the, the, the focus and the debate towards how perpetrators, especially states and, and other forms of institutions, keep this memory keep, and, and continue this experience. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mike? You're muted, yeah, yeah. Okay, I still can't hear you. I'll turn to Gilbert and then I'll oh, come back. No, oh, here you are, you're back. Okay, so yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, just, I, I'll just say that the things we talked about were 20th century um, traumas and um, related to state violence in general applied against categories of people. Okay, and I think um, there is a question of, of um, you know, how they continue to reverberate, but there's also a question of the kind of violence that we can see today and could see today. So in that sense, I think we have to be thinking about not just about the past and how the past plays out, but how, you know, the, the kind of challenges of the moment and the future, especially when with the rise of uh, hard right, kind of quasi fascist fascism all over the world kind of with the kind of environmental catastrophe that is often coupled with ethnic cleansing of, of indigenous populations and so forth. So that is, these things are, have also wider relevance. Thank you, yeah. Um, Gilbert. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, to, 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 for my final words, I just addressed the question that remained unaddressed about religion and war. Right, yes. Right, and uh, uh, yeah, well, I think that uh, uh, explaining wars by religion and by religious hatred is, uh, doesn't explain anything. Because actually, if you look at history, you will find that uh, the, the periods of, uh, of clash between religions are uh, much fewer than the, and much shorter than the periods of coexistence or peaceful coexistence between religions. So the, 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 the like, take, take, just to give you an example, for instance, you have a tendency which is very orientalist and simplistic in the media and even some, maybe some, some in the academia to explain what's going on in the Middle East now as a clash between Sunnis and Shia. And, uh, and you will have articles starting uh, 1000 years ago or, or 1500 years ago to explain what's going on, but that doesn't make sense. This is not what it is about. Uh, the, the issue is that religions at some point is used as one of the vehicle, one of the, the, the ideological tools uh, in, uh, in which a certain type of conflict of interest can be expressed. And that's what we have always to, to, to do, to, to, to look uh, beyond the religious, what are, uh, I mean, to look to the uses of religion. That's the key point, how religion is used. It's not religion per se, it's how it is used. And therefore, how it is used is a matter of, of, uh, of the kind of interests that are served by the kind of use that we are dealing with. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists and to the uh, festival organizers for putting together this uh, brilliant event, and particularly to Vikan for joining us uh, from Geneva. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, what I take away from this is, yes, the profound uh, profoundly complex character of trauma and history and memory. But I think I would also want to emphasize that we need to be a little bit critical about trauma as well and trauma politics as a mode of kind of conducting uh, political dialogue. Um, both what it gives us the opportunity to do, but what kinds of things it, it shuts down. Um, and particularly if we're thinking about movements that are pushing against uh, the elite or you know against existing power structures in some ways i think um uh trauma can be very powerful up to a point but then it can also box people in in a very uh immediate way um but thank you all thank you very much to the attendees for your participation and to all of the speakers um and i look forward to seeing you at more of the events in this festival ideas thank you everybody and thank you mira thank you for moderating and thank you all. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.